we've ever had of this new work, so we are super thrilled that you guys are here for its gestation and first birth. A um, couple quick housekeeping things. Uh, there won't be an emergency, but if there is, uh, the exits are all on this side. Uh, also, please turn off any cell phones or other devices that make noise. Uh, and afterwards, please buy drinks at the bar. Dixon Place is such a great organization, and we're so pumped to be in here tonight. Uh, and that's one of the ways that they keep sustaining uh, new works like this. So uh, please buy drinks after, and we'll also be there too if you have any comments that you would like to share. We've also included uh, inserts in your programs. If you have any thoughts, we'd really, really love to hear them, uh, as this is a developing piece. So without any further ado, this is North. Thank you so much. And the stars did wander, Chris darkling in the eternal space, I'm all alone. rayless and pathless. I got hurt, and the icy earth swung, blinding, I'm dying. blackening in the moonless air. I don't know what must. My days are yellow. The flowers and fruits stay. of love are gone. Help Only me. the worm, the canker, and the green. Anyone help me? Alone. I'm hungry. Why live? Come. Up to the field. To the north, man! The land of honorable death is here. Is there nobody here? Come and give away thy breath. I don't want to go home. To the north! Jack London is king. Why is there nobody here? God, I'm hungry. Help. Please. Mom. Anybody. Help me. Help. You find yourself dying. You cease to breathe. Your heart stops, your blood pressure drops, your body turns cold and worms consume your remains. Ugly business. Well, I suppose you wouldn't have to worry about that. Or how many hearts you will break. Or the long trail of questions you leave behind unanswered. Try to find glory in that. I thought not. I've realized something being out here so long. I'm only real happy if I have somebody. No, no, no. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm really digging this. Just being out here, in the wild, <laughs> in the wild. <laughs> but you know, I don't want to die. I've lived a happy life. Bye. God bless all. An autopsy from the coroner's office at Fairbanks shows that the man had died of starvation. The authorities have so far been unable to confirm the man's identity, and until they do, have declined to disclose the name they found among his possessions. John? What isn't it? 
journalist. Into the Wild by John Krakauer. Okay. <laughs> well, this is most unusual. <laughs> is it even appropriate for you to chat up a girl as ancient as I? <laughs> and ain't a love place? <laughs> ah, you and I were extracted from entirely different worlds, suspended in time to serve as characters in the same play. How disappointing would it be if we didn't share some scenes? Mm, right. Quite right. Journalist. Hmm. <laughs> well, maybe I can help you with this indeed. Bit of an unsettling business, this. <laughs> yes, how odd. <laughs> what? Oh, just my silly thoughts. <laughs> All right, it, it's just impossible to plan things out, each individual part, see, or entropy. We've got no control over anything, not even our own decisions, let alone predicting someone else's. But then, if you observe things at a distance, like when you stand back to look at one of Seurat's paintings, all those chaotic dots form patterns that make perfect sense. Everything seems to work that way. Blood cells, the magic that goes on in beehives, even galaxies. They all follow some sort of preordained rules, whether we like it or not. So what's the point of struggling with details, then? Oh, getting right down to serious matters, huh? Funny, you're the last person I thought would be a determinist. Well, uh, I think uh, when you look at things from afar, you can see the big pictures, right? Like if you look at entire species, individual animals, will start to resemble each other. Like the stories we have here, they have very similar themes. Any story, really, right? That doesn't make any of them not original or matter less. It's... The point is there. It's simple, dry. The whole point is in the presentation. Uh, comedies, tragedies, uh, throw in some gore over there, sex it up over here. It's, it's like when you take medicine. Some people like it fast and to the point with a syringe, while others, others prefer their sugar coatings. Yes, yes, you can say that. But if indeed we are all just spices and sugar coatings, as you say, <laughs> being characters as we are, then we are all important, but how utterly unnecessary. No, 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 of course not unnecessary. You could be the garnish in one dish and the main course somewhere else. Wait, do you think that we are the garnish in this play, or, uh... Oh. <laughs> By the way, I don't suppose we, uh, how much liberty to change the course of what's happened. Oh, but we do, John, we must! There has to be some way to figure out what went wrong. Each decision must lead to a different outcome, and surely we can choose not to repeat history. Uh, yeah, but you don't go that way. It's like trying to sort out messy threads. You're trying to find the roots. When, when you play chess, right, you know how you're going to checkmate, and then you just think backwards to figure out each step. I mean, of course, we're all usually confused and just trying to manage to look cool and do our best, but it's... You're saying that no matter how it begins, things will always end up the same. Well, that doesn't sound very exciting at all. <laughs> you say I'm a fatalist, John. It is the same story. Two young men go on a journey in search for their destiny. Oh, I'm sure the motivations are always complicated, but who cares? It's the next step that matters, not what came before. Let's not waste time arguing about it. I say we just put, we just put them beside each other. We put both stories side by side, and then we uh, figure them out. The plots, or whatever you like to call it, the uh, sugar coating. The death of an innocent. I'll state the facts, find the clues, what led to it, who, what killed the vagabond prince, and you, your mad gal. Yeah, you have such a strong connection to a romantic poet, why? Uh, say no more, it is not my position to probe. <laughs> It's always the romantic ones, isn't it, John? Eccentric, cynical, absolute fools when it comes to practical matters. The poet has spent his youthful years indulging in pleasurable sins, as he put it. Let us have wine and women, mirth and laughter. <laughs> <laughs> Sermons and soda water play often. 
Yet he was not content. Maybe it was those years at Harrow and Trinity devouring words by the ancient sages. There's a thirst in his heart that cannot be quenched by imitations of Spencer, costly drunkenness, or carnal indulgence. England was not for him. His heart was filled with a sorrow that he could not control, for none did love him but for his father's vast and vulnerable halls, the columns and domes and shambles, and pleasures tasted like venom that he almost longed for woe. Adieu, away from his home, his house, his lands, his ladies with eyes like gazelles, and locks as soft as clouds, and skin like velvet. <laughs> Away from his mother, who he dared not bid farewell, and from a sister that he did adore. He decided he wanted nothing to do with politics, and said, I'm, I'm a, a citizen, citizen of the world! world. Packed his heart, so he could improvise outpourings of self-expression. There was a sinking sun on the horizon when he bid his last... Adieu! Adieu, my native shore! Good night, gentlemen. All the world is ahead of us, forwards and onwards. B-R-I-T-T-A-N-I-A. -T -T what a grand word. It sickens me. The champions robbed of their pride. The defeated charlatans carried home trophies of deceit. And I doubt those morons in the office would blush for shame. It's politics, my dear fellow. Whoa. Whoa, hang on. <laughs> the war is still going on. You haven't noticed. There's always a this war used to be the death somewhere. of me, I'm telling you. I just thought of an excellent idea. I shall write a satire to mark their pointless disputes. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants something. Uh, I'd better sit down. <laughs> All the problems in the world, champ, concern you. This is to be the death of me! Hang in there, dear fellow. I don't want to see your breakfast for a second time. <laughs> you know what your problem is. I'll tell you what. You want to get out of the system. And that's not exactly possible, is it? And it's not sensible. You are... Oh, shh. Easy, Hobby. Easy. You know what I wish right now? I wish we could have taken Boatswain with us. Your dog? I'm practically dying on this damn boat, and you're thinking of your dog. All of England is a prison, and someone said that. Denmark. What about Denmark? All of Denmark is a prison. Shakespeare. <laughs> yes, well, I knew that. Yes, all of England is a prison, and it follows me wherever I go. I'm out here to discover the great beauty of the world, yet all I've seen is destruction. Spain, the romantic land, is now the playground of England's war games. We're supposed to be their allies, but what have we brought them but shame? Those dark-skinned Spanish maidens, oh, hobby, they lost their brothers and lovers to a tedious and all-consuming war. They've got fire in their breasts and tears in their eyes, and what passion, what desire, nourished by loss, strengthened by despair, I tell you that! I hear the saddest, sweetest music strung out from the wounds, and they look at me in awe because of my insignia. My name alone earns me wine and delicatessens. Isn't that funny? You play the part well. Signor Dapper English Lord, with his alabaster forehead and dark locks. And his incomparable ability to stay unstable, and his increasingly large supply of self-doubts. Embellished with a pair of sensitive, brooding eyes that women make a big fuss about. <laughs> George, you're prone to trouble. That's a given. <laughs> he thought you brilliant, that Pasha. Twenty times a day of sweet meats and honey soaked fruits. Now that is what we call infatuation, my lord. I am brilliant. Then do not mock Ali Pasha, Harvey. Lion of Vianina, they call him. Mahometan Bonaparte. Cruel, merciless. Such a dick to the ladies. But you have to admire his grip. There's no. Hypocrisy, the kind you and I both know too well. He's a terrible human being, but 
a first-rate general, learned, a genius, a huge stomach for blood, yet also for art. He's a first-rate ass, but some first-rate qualities, too. Yes, I am getting tired of those gifts. Well, his words, you are in need of a protector, of Lala. I think he fully intends to take you under his wings and keep you among his most treasured collection of rarities. Who needs a Lala when I've got you, the always collected and sensible John Cam Hophouse? Oh, come along now, I've got to show you the first <laughs> canto of, I'm calling it the Odyssey of Child Buren. It's only a working title. It must be the heir of these strange places. I've got my poet hat on, Hobby. And when we reach Athens, those we... days, Alex slept like a child of the wilderness, on sheets made of sand, and under a blanket of starlight each night. He's become a prince of the desolate land. His bedroom is the vast, sun-scorched desert. His crown is made of tumbleweeds. His throne is decorated with faded for sale signs and cracked tires. He welcomes the cold western winds which scraped his skin like blades. He's waiting for the spring, waiting for his moment, for his ultimate adventure. Hey, kid! Going somewhere? Yeah, um, I'm just camping out in the Bahada. I had walked, but it's getting kind of late. Could you take me, please, um, shout out by Oh My God Hot Springs? Where? <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> Thing is, I couldn't get him out of my head. He seemed intelligent, very much so. Good kid, polite too. Alex never told me a surname. Look, oh, Ron, don't worry. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Four years in college wasn't a total waste of time. I'm living like this by free will. I've been to places, okay, during the war. I've been to Shanghai, Okinawa, <laughs> at the best of times, oh yeah, <laughs> see the ugliest to life. I've made peace with this goddamn lousy business. See, life, life ain't what y'all want it to be. I wanted to tell him a thing or two about, you know, maybe I should have, but at the time, I wanted to believe him. I wanted to believe that maybe, that just maybe he'll succeed. And he'll come back. And he'll teach me a thing or two. <laughs> There's nothing much I could have done. Look, I just play my part. It drives me mad that he doesn't have a clue where he's headed towards. And I'm, I'm in no position to stop him. What are y'all looking at me for, eh? Look. Look, whatever I know, I already told you. Hey, Ron, you wouldn't mind if I came down sometimes to do my laundries, would you? Oh, of course not. You, you come by whenever you want. You like steaks? <laughs> we'll cook some up in the yard. You come down to my workshop. I can teach you some leather words. Uh, nah, nah. You're probably going to think it's boring. Oh, are you kidding me? I can't wait. This is quite extraordinary. Uh, yeah, it's just, um random collection of elements that made sense to me. I'm no artist, man. <laughs> but this is poetic. It is you, and that makes it a piece of art. The no U-turn sign. No turning back. Get it? <laughs> yes, of course. And, ah, and this no doubt. <clears throat> what does the N stand for? North. <laughs> My guess. I'm this close now. Two years, he's walked the earth. No phones, no pools, no pets, no cigarettes. <laughs> he's found the sweetest taste in the morning dews and the wild tomatoes. He lives in a constant state of wonder, constantly moving forward. The road welcomes him, accepts him as an extremist, an ecstatic voyager about to face his final and most incredible adventure. The climactic battle to finally kill the false being within and victoriously conclude the spiritual revolution. He can hear the calling of the great white north. Hello! 
He could feel the pure joy of ultimate freedom, unadulterated by the poisons of civilization. He has finally escaped, <laughs> escaped the prison that has held him for decades. And so, he walks alone upon the land. They become lost in the wild. Foiled, bleeding, panting, breathless, furious, dot follows dot, lance, lance, bloodied sand. Oh, rubbish. Ah, that was quite a show, wasn't it? He stops, triumphant, cries, ooh, that's good. He dies without a struggle. What were you saying? I, I said quite a show. It's like my life story in the center of the arena. Not surprising <laughs> you'd see yourself as a matador, glamour and all. Are you including that in your memoir? Once more, he stomps thundering. No, he bursts his thundering way. Vanity, is that all you see in me, Hobby? I am that bull. Did you see him, that gorgeous beast? Why am I always the only one who understands? Ah, oh, forget it. Or maybe for once it's just sport. I am that bull. Oh, I would break your goddamn legs if I catch you again, you hear me? You fucking hobo! So, there are two drawbacks to jumping trains. First is the filth. <laughs> Second is, you gotta tangle with those crazies like a bullfighter. Well, that one says he's got a revolver. <laughs> he found me with his stupid flashlight. And what a lunatic says he's gonna shoot me! <laughs> well, guess who jumped that same train not five minutes after that? So? What? Have you thought about it, Alex? About what? My proposal. You could. Oh. Yes? Can I change your mind, maybe? Well, the thing is, I could adopt you. I don't have any family left. You could be my grandson. What do you say? Hey? Ron. Ron, maybe let's um talk about this when I get back. You know, I'm already I'm already behind and if I don't leave by next week I won't make it to Alaska. And if, yeah, if I give up now, you know, it all would have been meaningless. All roads must end somewhere. There's just so much to see. And sure, you're going to say it's impossible to see it all. You're too old. Well, nobody lives forever, but that's no excuse not to get out there. I, look, I love this quote. The very basic core of a man's living spirit is his passion for adventure. The joy of life comes from our encounters with new experiences, and hence, there is no greater joy than to have an endlessly changing horizon for each day to have a new and different... You're Alaska guy again, isn't it? One with the British name? British name? <laughs> oh, you mean London? Yeah, Jack London. Not a British name, no. This, this was Henry <laughs> David Thoreau, wisest man in the universe. It's wanderlust, kid, and it's messing with your head. It's not good for you. There's things to learn from ordinary people, even if you look at them with contempt. No, not contempt. Pity. Age is only a relative term, my old friend. You're never too old as, as long as you keep an open mind, you keep moving forward, take on new adventures, discover new things. To test out uncharted water, you know there is no greater feeling than to just speed against the current, to set the sail high, let it take you on some unfamiliar course. Just don't settle down just because you're supposed to. <laughs> Move around. Just get out there. Get out there and do it. Take your potentials out for a run and embrace the stormy weather. It's good for the soul, man. Trust me. I hate bumpy roads. <laughs> you know, a wise man once said, you can't hate something you've never known. 
or understood. That Tural again, was it? <laughs> Thoreau. No, this one was Tolstoy. You know, you really should read War and Peace. Pierre is probably, no, is most certainly his greatest character ever. Paper! It's just that people made a paper. It's not good for you. It's not all bad, living in this society. You know, there is a sickness. There's a kind of obsession in this society. People chase after instant gratification and seek comfort that only involves materialistic gain and measure happiness in only things that, are, that clink or are calculable with digits. And people are so eager to fit into these cookie cutters, so desperate to plunge into this gridlock of a society, just moving along without any purpose, accepting mediocrity, staying silent, and never questioning why. And then, then, then there are those who are in the better off position to it actually becomes their jobs, to use such obsession and sickness to their advantage. The, 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 the people became like numbers. They're, they're programmable. And, and corporations and, and universities, they, they, they teach you how to manipulate them so that we may achieve this vision, this, this desire of those few on the upper echelon. And then there are those who have reached the top and they, they've realized how entangled they've become, but it's too high a cliff to fall from and there's too much to lose. No shame in wealth, Alex. Especially if you know how to use it. <clears throat> Nothing wrong with having a little money in your pocket. Use it wisely. Stay. I'll show you. You can make a living here. Honest living. You think about it, eh? Come on. No. You don't get it, Ron. It's not about where I end up. I just... I can't live a life without constantly changing scenes when there is so much out there. Sunrise gives me itchy feet and I, I just... I have to explore. God, I feel like my blood is boiling. I hate, see, I hate living in a society where, where people don't see the beauty of the universe, the things they care about, they're petty, and, and, and they throw away common decency and principles just to maintain some social status or increase some stock price. But tell me, Alex, didn't a wise man once say, uh, you can't understand something you never knew no. or understood. I understand it enough to know that I never want to be a part of it. You're 24. like these, when bankruptcy, felony, and fraud are found in a station not far beneath that of your lordships, why would you find it baffling that the lowest portion of the people, the once most useful portion of the people, should forget their duties and their distresses and are famished into guilt? The demands for work and workmen diminished, and those men destroyed their looms because they had become useless, worse than useless. They were willing to dig, but the spade was in other hands. They were not ashamed to beg, but there were none to relieve them. Their own means of subsistence were cut off, all other employments preoccupied. My lords, we no longer even flinch at the sounds of suffering, and have become so very good at dodging responsibilities. When a proposal is made to emancipate or relieve, you hesitate. You Deliberate for years. You temporize and tamper with the minds of men. Yet you are all readily willing to sign off on a death bill without a thought of the consequences. Without inquiry, without deliberation, passing the bill would only add injustice to irritation and barbarity to neglect. Suppose it passes. Suppose one of those men, the one from whose hands you took away the bread, and the tools he supports his family with, and you drag him into the court to be trialed with the new offense, 
You can condemn him, you can charge him guilty, but you are just twelve butchers for a jury and a Jeffries for a judge. Give me a
Does your dad know where you are? Did you tell your mom what yeah, your Yeah, stop was? trying to mother me, Jan. <laughs> uh, it's not right. <laughs> Bob. What am I supposed to say? You are not helping. <laughs> Man, don't worry about me. I came out here because I want to enjoy a pure existence. Where I grew up, it's all corruptions and hierarchies. Out here, out here, nobody cares if you're slick or rough, if you wear suits, or if you haven't showered in weeks. <laughs> Look, I've, I've, I've learned this on the road. Life and death is so much to the mercy of nature and the kindness of strangers and you, Jan, and Bob. <laughs> I wouldn't give a meeting you two for the world. The tramp, you see, never had any problem with strangers. He loved those brief encounters, building friendships with individuals he met along his way. He called it his great Alaskan, Alaskan odyssey. odyssey. It's been on my bucket list ever since I read Call of the Wild. Have you read it? Everyone should. Then you'll know what I mean. Jack London never left to study, but that doesn't matter, now does it? I'm worried about Tracy. She's just a kid. She's too young for a heartbreak. Exactly. She's a kid. She's got a crush. She'll get over it. What's the big deal? I knew this was going to happen. He's got that look, you know, <laughs> the kind that little girls make a fuss about. What's the big deal? I don't know. You tell me. Because he don't know any better, and you have got to help me get these crazy ideas out of his head. He's not your son, Jan. I keep trying to tell you. And he'll be fine. Tracy will be fine. Kids, they'll know better someday right now. They're entitled to make some stupid decisions. Yeah. Disappointments, huh? Well, life. You gotta take some shit sometimes. I feel responsible, though. I mean, we don't, we don't just come together for nothing. Of course not. We come together to save each other's souls. <laughs> you know what? You gotta leave the kid be. Alex will be fine. I'm telling you. Tracy, come give us a hand, would you? A week, maybe two. She'll get over it. She'll be fine. Trust me. when none intrudes by the deep sea with music in its roar. I love not man the less, but nature more. Roll on, thou deep and dark blue ocean roll. Ten thousand fleets sweep over thee in vain. Man marks the earth with ruin. His control stops at the shore. Like a drop of rain, he sinks into thy depths with bubbling groan without a grave, unknown. Uncoffin and unknown. Mad, bad, and dangerous to know. His former lover called him that. I think my mother shared that opinion. I wasn't allowed to look at a picture of him until I was twenty. She was so afraid I'd inherit that insanity from my father. Well, about that, she's uh, she's probably right. You are about as mad as your father. Thank you, John. I, <laughs> I mean, that's a compliment. I'm flattered. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the whole, the whole thing about you, the time you lived in, all, all the things you did. You, you seem to be walking on a hinge between the romantic precedence and the age of enlightenment. A puzzling point in history, for sure. Men had seen the wrath of war and mourned the loss of whole empires and were seeking refuge in machinery. It's, Dependability, the comfort supplied by logic. My father's generation breathed poetry and farted in rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> they suffered from 
from ennui as a sign of their spiritual depth and live their honey-dipped high life built upon depths and hollow ground. Never seems to base their actions on logic. But my father also married the princess of Parallelogram. Alas, those, those neatly numbered stanzas in Child Hound and the octaves in Don Juan was a sure sign of his obsession with numbers, even if unknowingly. So I suppose the mad, bad, and dangerous blood in me is inevitable because poetry and mathematics are like, are like a pair of twins, somehow always finding their way back together. I mean, I can feel it. There's something infinitely enchanting about numbers and calculations. Uh, enchantress of numbers, they called you. Oh yes, my unofficial title. <laughs> the world was in such a state of chaos, we simply had to turn to something less effervescent than human emotions. Numbers are safe, dependable, easy to control. Science depends on them. I'm helping my friend, Charlie Babbage, design this machine, the analytical engine. It can work out equations 100 times faster than any man. True, it doesn't take any initiative or have any eureka moments, you know, the spark, but you have to admit that it's beautiful. The engine works in perfect harmony, weaving algebraic patterns the way a jacquardine weaves flowers and leaves. <laughs> That's pretty ironic, right? Mm. We call ourselves the civil men and decide that we can live independent of Mother Nature. People have been altering, colonizing, destroying the lands even, and yet we always end up following and subjugating to the laws of nature. We uh, build machinery, develop technology, but it all seems like some pathetic attempts to recreate patterns already existing on the earth in numbers and figures. <laughs> if that, if that is what science is about, well, I don't... science isn't just balancing equations, calculating numbers, or operating machines. Oh, You're trying to be a bit more optimistic, John. This brain of mine is something more than merely mortal, as time will show. The ideas, as my father would have called them, the Prometheus sparks, are in there somewhere. Who says there's nothing poetical in science? Progress. That's what it's all about. You said it yourself. Each new idea must be built upon something that's already there, but that doesn't make the new ideas any less original. We are like, we are like links on a chain that connects man to God, or if you prefer, call it the ultimate truth. It's a blessing to find those links we're meant to interlock with. It makes you feel unafraid, doesn't it? The thought of it? Knowing that life is supposed to be short, but it keeps on going. Pick up the torch from somebody, and when it's your turn, you pass it on to another. <laughs> Not afraid. <laughs> uh, I'm terrified. Who knows if what we're talking about right now, this very moment, will be some sort of legacy or laughing stock. That torch you pass on to someone. Is it <laughs> going to light their way or is it just going to leave a mighty burn on their hands? Both, I'm afraid. Matter, matter antimatter, hero, antihero. The tramp was dead. All I'm trying to do is figure out what led to his doom. How step by step he went head on towards... A lot of people say it was unnecessary. Why? Why would he throw every single thing away? You are a journalist. You get all excited about clues. <laughs> question, question, question. What happened before? Why? How did it happen? I'm not saying those things don't matter. Isn't the next step always a bit more important? Things change, people change, mistakes happen because none of us is perfect. Flaws <laughs> are expected anyway. It's what you do with them that concerns me. Would you fix it? Would you get someone to help you? Would you smash the whole thing and start over? The perfectionists do that. Perfectionists or escapists. Words. Just words. And here upon the waters once again the winds. The winds and their endless whispers. England is not for me. You are Harold's daughter, and Byron is Harold. What am I? Nothing. But not you, my dear child. You are the soul of my thoughts, and will forever be with me as I traverse the earth. I 
wasn't sure if I saw him first or if he did me. Hmm. I was bored. The dance floor was never my place. Your father was, well, he was putting on a masquerade. Every gesture was a pose, and every expression something to cover his disgust towards himself and the absurd amount of women around him. Those restlessly thoughtful eyes. You've got those eyes, Ada. I was afraid, I was so afraid that you would... But you understand. You have to understand. Don't do it, Annabella. For God's sake, don't. He's trouble. He's going to suck the life out of you and you'll be ruined forever. Oh, Annabella, you're always so stubborn. You're just having a crush like the rest of us. He's going to find you refreshing at first. He's going to quote the Scottish play and woo you with his pretty letters full of Milton and Pope. And then he's going to lose interest in you and brush you off like dust. Stop deceiving yourself. You never loved him. <laughs> Let's change the subject, shall we? <clears throat> 1816, the poet exiled himself in style and went to spend the summer in a villa near Lake Geneva, bringing with him his personal position and diarist, a young couple still in the bliss of their recent engagement, and, oh, <laughs> you'll like this one, John. <laughs> An adoring mistress. Whose <laughs> <laughs> existence he barely acknowledged. Outside of the bedroom, that is. <laughs> Uh, beginning of a joke. Might as well be a joke, my dear fellow. <laughs> How does it feel to be a celebrity best-selling author? People start to have too many questions. You should know this, Mr. Scribe. Do you like my ride? I'm most proud of it. Uh, didn't the Scotch Review or the English Bards have something nice to say about your work? I mean, those are like the New York Times for your day, right? Uh, I don't think he'd agree with you. <laughs> Indeed. The same haggle of idiots that praised Turdsworth, that vulgar louse. Degenerate Britons for shame. Hey, don't you like my ride? That ostentatious thing is a copy of Napoleon's coach. He's got an age old thorn against critics ever since hours of idleness with whole stagnant water. Ostentatious, <laughs> ignorant swine. This is called building a personal image. To be fair, hours of idleness wars stagnant water, but their occasional accuracy doesn't make them any less of the buffoons that they are. Believe a woman or an epitaph or anything else false before you believe critics. It's their habit to seek roses in December and ice in June. They honor the bard who elegizes an arse and praise the dullest things. No matter, George continues still to write, although the name is veiled from public sight. Right or wrong, call it a lampoon, call it an offense, I'll publish. Child Harold has returned from England and I want, and I shan't return to that prison. Well, is that the real reason you had to flee England? That seems hardly convincing. Well, aren't you all particular about the past and fussy about details? Now, how could you imagine any other because reason? Because we have to get on with the story, my dear papa. Would you please be most candid with us? It's the only way. I am. No matter. My conscience is clear. Mm. Would you two stop uh, osculating? <laughs> Child Harold is now a fugitive. <laughs> His mother gone, his wife left, his daughter lost, his creditors after him like flies on a rotting piece of meat. The people at the Gazette are chattering on and on about things they know nothing about. The British Lord and his incestuous love affair was the talk of the town. A radical move, even for you. Augusta Lee and I are merely half sister and brother. And what do they care about her anyway? What do they care about me? The only thing they care about is having someone to be the subject of mockery. You know how it is to be a celebrity best-selling author, right, John? <laughs> One day, your words are gospel, blasphemy the next. One day, you're determined, adventurous, the next day, and you're headstrong and irresponsible. Words, words, words. Oh, would you two stop licking each other? so close now. <laughs> the 
castle of Chillon shrouded in this grassy mist, I feel I can just close my eyes and touch its cold stone walls covered in vines. Oh, what agony! Oh, such expectation. <laughs> Mary, my sweet Eloise, we are to be two lovers spending a summer at the foot of the Alps. It's the most delightful sight. So much different from the gloom that is England. <laughs> this divine weather, I feel like a new-fledged bird and hardly care what twig I fly to, so that I may try my newfound wings. Warm sunshine, sweet summer wind, the lake. Would you look at that lake, blue and sparkling gold, and across the water, Oh, there it is, the black mountains and towering above <laughs> Mont Blanc, majestic, majestic Mont Blanc, the highest, the queen <laughs> of all. Only to be shut from your sight by the clouds. <laughs> this place seems to be haunted by perpetual thunderstorms, all those castles and dungeons, the things nightmares are made of. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a blood-sucking monster preying on the villagers at night. <laughs> there it is, our top buzz killer as usual, Dr. Polidori. Be careful with the cage, you'll hurt Monsieur Peacock. Come, come now. Villa Diodati shall accommodate us all comfortably. Oh, there you are! <laughs> you just have to, don't you? Milton at Villa Diodati. Oh, isn't it splendid? Oh, Claire! <laughs> oh, this is like a dream. Oh, aren't you supposed to be in deep debt or something? Of course I'm in deep debt. What would you expect of an English gentleman other than to be living off loans? Covetousness is rich. Modesty starves. Why should I be stoic for a country that presents me with shackles every way I turn? You see that mountain there? <laughs> it seems to be shrouded in the mist. <laughs> Quite majestic. <coughs> oh, yes. Seems to have taken shape from a fantasy far, far above, piercing the infinite sky. There's an illusion of an absolute serenity. It calls out to you from the north like a malevolent creature to be conquered. But do not fall for the deceptive sunlight. The eternal brightness. It has a voice, the mountain. A shadow in a trance, sublime and strange. It devours it all, those icy rocks, those unfathomable deeps and frozen floods. Men of great expectations shan't fear the elements, Shelley. Mad atheist Shelley. I thought you'd be indifferent to divine power. Nature's a bitch. <laughs> Inspires a great deal, but also never hesitates to punish. A merciless executioner, indeed. I don't see God having anything to do with it. But that doesn't mean, well... You can't reason with nature, can you? But you ought to be reasonable and stay in awe in order to appreciate it, to enjoy it, be a part of it. Oh, for instance, I love water. All kinds of you know, lakes, creeks, oceans, rivers. But I cannot swim, so you don't see me plunging into a Hollis Pond as much as I admire your accomplishment. But you go sailing, Bish. Drives me mental. Nature's a bitch, I say. <laughs> Gorgeous. Terrible temper. It's simply suicide if you fight against her power. Without a plan? To be sure, it is suicidal, going head-on against the law of nature. But there must be some modern Prometheus in every era, just to push our limits further, bit by bit. Oh, well, surely you understand. We're living in an age where artisans are no longer needed, and machines are replacing men in factories with an equal amount of ridiculousness and genius to it. Looks like another storm is brooding. 
I say we head in for the day, shall we, Lord Byron, Mr. Shelley, Miss Goodwin, Miss Claremont? <laughs> we shall continue our ghost stories to pass the time. It seems most appropriate. <laughs> yeah. How was the one you were telling go, Mary? You talked to the brain figure. Oh, yes. He is a genie. A from one of the most distinguished families of that republic, actually. His name is Victor. Victor Franklin. Mary Godwin. She was the one that. Oh, oh yes, Mrs. Shelley was a good friend. She always had a great deal to say about well, everything I suppose. <laughs> she told me all about that memorable summer by the lake. The novel was a huge sensation. Oh yes, it played in playhouses everywhere. In fact, she had to publish it anonymously at first, you know. Oh, wise choice. The one affair. You see, people take it more seriously if you're a man. Men would take me more seriously if my name was Adam and not Ada. And so, uh, well, there is something about these mountains, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> Altitudes make you imagine all sorts of things. It's the best, miss. Well, there's just nothing like it. I remember one year I was with my family, with my dad. We were climbing the old rag. Shenandoah, and, and then we were in Colorado. I was 12 years old, and we were going to go up Long's Peak. That's a 14er, and we got to the 13,000 foot elevation. That's what they call it the keyhole, and he wouldn't let me go any further. He said it was too dangerous the route. I could have been on top of the Rocky Mountains, or you could have been dead. Come home, Chris. At least a phone call. I've been keeping your mail like you asked, but I can't lie for you forever. Hey, Mom and Dad are so worried. What, do you, what am I supposed to tell them? What am I supposed to do? I just can't keep living there anymore, Corrine, when I know everything is a lie. I've satisfied their vanity long enough. Been a good son, gotten good grades. If I stay there, I just... I'll explode one day, and I'll cause more damage to everybody. You already have, Chris. Just don't worry about me, sis. I've never felt more alive. Alexander Supertramp is not the same jaded college student from a year ago. He's lived on the street with hobos and bums. <laughs> he's, he's learned to fall in love with the exhilaration of living life to the fullest extent. He has grown and learned much, much more than what any college can offer. I mean, you understand, right? You're the only person in the whole world who could possibly understand what it is I have to say. Well, I do. I'm... I'm starting to wonder if I do. The whole system is broken. And Mom and Dad are just as degenerate and corrupt. Look, you can have a different kind of life, too. Learn the true meaning of living. If you want something in life, you should just go out there and grab it. Just, just Go after it. Don't be like those pricks, living in lies and only caring about themselves. All they care about is money. There is so much beauty in just the mountains and the creeks. You don't need to give in to this sick society. You are not one of I them. I am one of them, Chris. I can't do what you do. I can't just get out there and leave everything, everyone that cares about you behind and go after what? Willow of the Wisp? You don't even know if you're dead, or if you'll be dead tomorrow. I'd rather die tomorrow than live another day in a society full of hypocrites. All their lies and superficial desires, they're neglecting what really matters. That's a hell of a selfish thing to say, Chris. You're not alone. Your ideal way of existence, conjuring your spiritual connection with your literary heroes and Mother Nature, that's no way of life. You're not Pocahontas! <laughs> Even if none of us matters to you, you're still a part of our lives, a part of me, a part of Mom and Dad. They've disappointed you, yes, but you, you're only this angry because you still care. No, they just never take me seriously! Do you know they wanted to pay for my law school as if I was going to go? I mean, they, they don't actually care what I want, and they think they can just 
buy my respect. I mean, what's the deal with buying me a new car? My Datsun is the best in the world. There's never any problem with it. I've told them that a million times. God, I'm telling you, this is it. This time I'm knocking them out of my life completely. I'm never talking to those idiots ever again. Alex. <laughs> He's a piece of work. <laughs> a real uh, piece of work. What were you thinking? All that time and not a word with your folks, treating them like dirt. I'm telling you. Kid, I got, I got a kid that works for me. Fuck, he don't even got no goddamn parents. And you ain't gonna hear him bitching. Whatever the deal was with your folks, I've seen worse, I guarantee you. You knew him well. Real good kid. Maybe a little bit stuck in here, society. Always saying society. Bunch of things. But mostly it's folks. He's a real good kid, I gotta say. I thought he was shy at first. <laughs> but once you get to know him, you know, bang, you couldn't shut him up. <laughs> Talked a lot of things, serious things, going on and on about books. <laughs> there aren't a lot of people that like to talk books in Carthage, you know, use a lot of big words. Wouldn't have think he'd be more interested in working with us farmers. A uh, college boy, you know. Popped out of nowhere him. Got a lot of attention, for sure. Oh, for sure. It's <laughs> a small town. Sure about this kid? Yep. <clears throat> Name? Iris for you. IRS fuck you. <laughs> Exempt. Exempt. Except address. Oh, none of my goddamn business. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't have a social security number. I don't remember it. Look, I work hard. I just need to save up some travel money. When is the last time you ate? A couple of days, maybe. All right. Let's get you something to eat. All right. Iris. Come on, <laughs> tell me some slack. What's your name? It's Alexander. Just Alex. Oh, just Alex. Alexander. What are you? Greek? Where are you from? <laughs> oh, look. None of my goddamn business, right? Uh -huh. Let's get us some beer. All right. <coughs> Oh, <laughs> Carthage, uh, South Dakota. Population, I don't remember the exact number, but uh, less than 300. There is one bank, one grocer, one bar. Nothing ever happens in Carthage. To me, Carthage means the shining city of the Phoenicians. Mm -hmm. That place where that powerful woman ruled and destroyed, Queen Dido. That name, could it be merely a coincidence? Ah, uh, a businessman from Carthage, New York, named the place after his hometown. Like those guys do when they came over to America. New England, New Amsterdam, uh, there's a Manhattan in Kansas. Sometimes when people leave their hometown, they can't bring it with them, so they just call the, same pla the new place the same name. It's all the memories packed up in a few syllables. So they never forget, even though they can never return. How romantic. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but there are 42 cities named Carthage in America. I don't know the story behind every one of them. It could be arbitrary. How could it be arbitrary, John? Names, it's one of those things you use as keys to access the past. Sometimes it's actual things, like a, a touch, a picture, a piece of a jewel. But sometimes it's more abstract, a tune, a scent. The name of a person, the name of a place, and all the memories of centuries past. Forty-two cities named Carthage. Oh, I imagine there are different stories behind each one, but I trust that they all trace back to that one Carthage, the same place where Aeneas stolen broke Queen Dido's heart. It's never just a name, John. 
A name carries music and memories, the mere sound of it. Okay. <laughs> it sounds like a place where the hero has to make some tough decisions. The story of a man discovering himself. Sounds like a good place to throw in some establishment scenes. For such a long time, he has put on the persona, a mask of an obedient child of sophisticated education and social grace. But now, he has found his true destiny. No longer will he use the identity forced upon him by his birth, by the hypocritical society that has held him back for so long. From now on, his name is Alexander Supertramp. <laughs> That's a mighty title you've got for yourself. <laughs> well, I needed a name. It does sound like a warrior. Don't you like it? A mighty warrior who talks <coughs> to himself to pass the time. Splendid! Uh, I'm in solitude, but I am least alone. I have the best of companions in these. Let me paraphrase Rousseau here. Those things only make you talk about things you know nothing about. A vice that I'm guilty of myself. Honest opinion, super trap. It is idiotic, your new name. You shan't be too hasty with these things. You want your name to mean something when it's uttered on someone's lips thousands of years from now. It's the one word you'll be remembered by. <laughs> remembered? Remembered for what? For fame, for admiration, the usual... For fame, for fame, he says. Let me paraphrase Thoreau here. Rather than love, than money, than faith, than fame, than fairness, Give me truth. Oh, don't be daft. Fame! Of course it is on your agenda. Believe me when I tell you this. Even if you find the whole truth of the universe, it's no good unless you've got someone to share your discoveries with. <coughs> That's a lofty notion. Beauty of the wilderness. New experiences. They're only any good if you've got someone to share them no, with. You don't understand. The whole point is to just get out there, man. Just myself, no, no nothing, nobody else, just me, just out there, just living, man, just... Why am I even explaining myself to you? You want to be remembered? What are you supposed to be remembered for? Oh, um, a sex-obsessed poet who couldn't keep his hands off his own sister? Half sister! <laughs> Extravagance and stupid scandals. The things and connections that are attached to your name, they're all just a shroud of privilege and pretension. Stop lecturing me. Hey, it's not too late to change your ways. I mean, look at your pointless entrees and the, the things are just things, things, things. They prevent you from seeing the real beauty. See, tramping gets most exciting when I'm penniless, you know? You should really uh, let go of this Rococo bourgeois lifestyle. There's a much better kind of wealth. If we all desired nothing and lived like cavemen, we'd be extinct by now. And also, Rococo is so 18th century. Hardly my era, you fool. <laughs> <laughs> Your name. You, my name, my title brings me to places, you understand? Perhaps to use the language of your generation, it brings me press. Uh, there's no shame in using shortcuts when trying to achieve a greater goal. If my name can be a knocking stone, why shouldn't I use it? It's simply wrong, giving up your identity. It's where you came from. Now there's a thought. The question of where you're from shan't be answered by some geographical location. We're citizens of the world. Yes. Our name, um, our birthplaces, home addresses are just facts. It's your family that defines who you are, no matter how much you may think you despise them. Name. Your family name. It's the oldest form of magic. Given an opportunity, a single word can conjure the memory of your entire no. lineage. No, 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 no. You are missing the whole point. Oh. The whole purpose of this, this journey, this pilgrimage, is to kill this former identity and all the connections attached to it with those imbecile pricks. Chris Mc 
canvas is the bastard son to slaves of a sick society. And I, I don't want that lineage. I don't want the memory that comes with it. I don't, I don't want the, the shame it carries. I don't want this stupid, that glory, some name on a space satellite. Yeah, yeah, America's favorite son proudly presents NASA's first oceanographic satellite. It's so pathetic. The Soviets have one, we gotta have one too. CSAT 1, to their Sputnik, billions of dollars explode and burn up into ashes for what? The vain sons of bitches can't even take care of their own families. When are they gonna start looking at the real problems? People are starving, they're homeless, they are dying. And what is the government doing? They're sending school teachers into space! Hello! <laughs> there you are, boy. I have been looking for you everywhere. Come on. Daydreams ain't gonna get you nothing. You wanna know something? My buddy, Jackie D here, you wanna know what he says? He says, fuck him. And enjoy the party, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, fuck him. It's just, what do you have to worry about, huh? You're a good kid. You know that. Just, you're just a kid. You have your whole life ahead of you. Come on. Yeah, there you go. Come on. that I deserve to be happy. I presume now you've changed your mind. No, I do think you deserve to be happy. I don't think you deserve to be loved. But I still love you. Part of me still couldn't let that go, and now I'm being punished for it. We were perfectly matched for a bit. For a bit, indeed. We are like lithium and fire. Gives quite a sight. But then it just turns into ashes. Still quite a sight when it was burning. Spectacular. We were just for show, weren't we? I remember thinking I had to know him. The author of Child Herald. If I considered any man my soul's equal, he'd be you. I remember thinking that I'd love him, even if he looked as ugly as Esau. Oh, shut up. You wouldn't love me if I looked like Esau. <laughs> Vanity, it's ridiculous, but we both thrived on it. Lucky for me, isn't it? That beautiful, pale face is my destiny. Even if it means I'll be disgraced, cast Can't out... Can't you just leave me in peace? I am sorry. I shall always remain your friend. Please believe me when I tell you that. If there were anyone who could understand me completely, it'd be you. Why are you always trying to escape from everything? You're practically obsessed with making yourself miserable. Always, always running away from places and your friends and your conquest of women. Can't you stay for once? Stay for a while. I'm jealous of you. Yes, I do understand you completely. Please make your acquaintance, John, <laughs> Countess, Shelley, ah, Byron. <laughs> It's an honor, Mr. Hunt. Please make an acquaintance, Mr. Hunt. There's a sense of self-righteousness in you. By the way, I didn't care for it when we first met. Colorful character, indeed. Colorful character. Always swimming somewhere. The Thames. The great canal of Venice. I didn't care for him. I never thought him a great poet. 
Those bad volumes are behind me now, I hope. The new cunt. Neither of us is short of bad volumes. The, the, the new cunt. Be honest with me, Hunt. I've taken some risks with those. Child Harold is... I am no longer that sulking young man leaving England many years ago. The new canto is a masterpiece. That French style in your original pieces is gone. And I think you found it. You found your rhythms and style. Now you go directly to nature for inspiration. I believe you are on your way to becoming a great poet. We should have been there, Mr. Hunt. There's something about going up those mountains. We crossed the Alps, Byron and I. It would have been brilliant if you could have been in our company. Those black rocks are as if locked in time, and you can almost hear the whispers of those mountains. Speaking of all the memories from hundreds and hundreds of years ago, it's the same snow that Milton and Rousseau once left their footprints in, Mr. Hunt. It almost makes you forget about the nuisance of men you had to deal with in London. There is something about those mountains. Up there, up there I was half dust, half deity. I was in such a state of melancholy, yet I was ecstatic at the same time. Isn't it a funny feeling? It would be a good idea to get away from it once. None of our minds can be at peace. Very strange. Two years of prison wasn't actually that unbearable. And now that I'm out, I, I feel more confined than when I was in a cage. Half of my friends are dead, the other half in exile. I remember it like yesterday. You were sending me tickets to the Drury Lake. Then all of a sudden I awakened from the drowsiness that prison had gotten me accustomed to. And I see the sorry state that England is in. Even worse than before the war. They say we won. But what does winning even mean? The poor used to barely make ends meet, and now they have no work. Starving to death. Deadly business for rain spattering, windpipes slitting, and the cause is rarely sanctified. It's all still going on. I fear it's only getting worse. Napoleon is playing chess at St. Helena's, and Wellington, he has turned the whole world in debt of him. He is, I'm going to use Shakespeare, the best of cutthroats. But how can he not hear the cry from his famished nation? How can he not offer a slice or two, at least, from his luxurious meals to those shivering hands? What's the use of his victory when the nation is only skin and bones? I'd be delighted to know who, other than him, benefited from Waterloo. I'm afraid the answer to that question wouldn't make either of us happy. <laughs> Shelley, I've read your piece. It's against my will. The examiner is, I am under a lot of pressure. One day every living soul should read. But not now, not yet. The public at large is not sufficiently discerning to do justice to that sincere and kind-hearted spirit of yours that walks in this flaming robe of birth. But Mr. Somehow Hunt, I is... find that unsurprising, though infuriating all the same. I'm never going back there. What good can you do when you're locked up, eh? <clears throat> Jail? Shelley, words are dangerous. L listen to me. You too, Byron. You want to change the side. Radical moves won't do. I've learned my lesson. I hope the prison cell hasn't made you a coward. Come join us in Italy, Mr. Hunt. The liberal can use another sharp tongue and kindred spirit. I'm afraid I wouldn't be much use to you, gentlemen. I understand your frustration, but please hear me. Think twice before you... Is never the best solution, running away from the problem? We're all part of the problem. Don't stop! I know what you're thinking. You think you're above. None of us is hero material. We're writers. There's only so much we can do. Together, Mr. Hunt. Think about it. What if together we can be powerful? Those people in Manchester, tens of thousands of them. It's like the entire universe was silent that day but for Peter Spiegel. And they lay their bodies down, only to be trampled by the cavalries. 
They have nothing left, just their flesh and blood. Those high and mighty ones were shame. Little William was only two years old, first sacrificed. But if nobody does anything, does anything, um, 1988 is like the most politically corrupt and scandalous year ever, and it's only March. I don't even want to think about it. No, I am not saying that Jesse Jackson should be president. End of discussion. I am just pissed that he's not even taken seriously. I mean, they're saying that he doesn't even want to be president. I mean, what kind of nonsense is that? I mean, we finally have a black man putting together on a presidentially extraordinary campaign, and what is that? Is it just like a formality? <laughs> is there supposed to be a better time when a black man should be on the ticket? Would you be so kind to let me know when that time is? Year 2000? 3000? I mean, they can all rot in hell! Okay, They're Chris, calm down. <laughs> it's politics, okay? You can only move it a little bit at a time. Promise me you won't get yourself into trouble, okay? Mom and Dad are... They're just as corrupt as the rest you know, of them! Dad's a scientist, so, you know, he doesn't really care about politics altogether. And Mom is... They're not monsters, okay? I think they just want what's best for My them. grades are good enough to get into Harvard Law. What more could they do? Okay, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm thinking... Saying. <laughs> Alaska. Don't look at me like that. This will be good for me. This is just going to be our secret. I promise. He was a traveler for the most part, those years. He chose a life that includes much pain amidst delight, like a child at the market, always eyeing the next novelty constantly having to sacrifice what he's already holding on to. There was always something new to look forward to, I suppose. It was a pleasurable pain I'd had to bear, falling for a genius. Stand he calm and resolute, like a forest close and mute. With steady eyes and looks which are weapons of unvanquished war. And if then the tyrants dare, let them ride among you there. Slash and stab and maim and heal. What they like, that let them do. With folded arms and steady eyes, in little fear and less surprise. Look upon them as they slay, till their rages died away. Then they will return with shame to the place from which they came. And the blood thus shed will speak in hot blushes on their cheek. Men of England, heirs of glory, heroes of unwritten story, Nurslings of one mighty mother, let a vast assembly be, and with great solemnity declare with measured words that ye are as God has made ye free. Rise like lions after slumber, in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. Remember that great peace march from two years ago? Just the, the scale of it. I, I can't get over it. <laughs> from California to Washington, D.C. Monks, businessmen, doctors, mothers with kids, 1,500 people making an exclamation point across America. God, just the scale of that. I can't, I can't imagine it. But what now? What difference did it make, huh? We're still living the same lie. The little people's interest still doesn't matter. I 
knew that, that one day he might just lash out. I wasn't surprised. Devastated? Yes. But not entirely surprised? <clears throat> uh, growing up, we were both bullheaded. My brother more so than I was. We clashed with our parents every step of the way. He was always so concerned about a lot of things, always saying there was so much wrong with society and getting irritated because the rest of us had the capitalist zeal. But he was the wealthiest of all, of love, of sympathy. I think he just had to believe it for himself that somehow he could make a difference. Accident? Accident? No. No, no, no! Damn it if I believe half a syllable in this! It has been... It has been an assassination. I'm sure of it. I told him not to get into politics. <laughs> You're not a politician, Beach, I said. It's going to kill you, Wonder. <laughs> as powerless as the rest of us, Chris. You know that. My brother was always a romantic. He was a poet at heart. He was just a poet. <laughs> Someone who awakens melody in the silent chords of the human heart. A light in an otherwise darkling and shadowed world. His soul is the mirror of nature, reflecting her back 10,000 times more lovely. His soul is so abundant with love, with sympathy. It gave life to his treasure house of imagination and ardent enthusiasm. That love beautifies everything in the universe creating a little world within his soul. A copy of the outer one, but more entire, more faultless. A desperate romantic. <laughs> That's what he was. Headstrong and ready to support any cause that would turn him into the heroes he'd read about in books. as a sailor. Storms never dampened his spirit. To break the waves, to be borne like bubbles upon the sea, to feel such terror. But what a pleasing fear. We were going to have a game, my friend and I. And I was going to win. My friend is burning on a pyre and I... I feel sick, I have to go. You're going swimming? Again, coward. You can never face it, can you? Your true feelings. What amount of water can wash away your guilt now? Hmm? All these glorified deeds you plan on doing, is it just so you can escape your personal issues? Would a coward swim across Hell's Point? Look at this club-footed madman. He's done it 12 years ago. The ocean, you monster with hypnotizing roars. I have loved you, and I'm drawn by your power. The same force that's taken the lives of people I loved. Empires rise and fall on the shore. Assyria, Greece, Rome, Carthage, all gone. The ocean rolls on. Kings, tyrants, knights, savages, thieves, all... 
passers by. Ten thousand Achaean fates all turned into ashes. The only image of eternity is this body of water, this almighty form. States fall, arts fade, only natural forces conquer all. The lives of men, of dynasties even, how insignificant, flashes by like a whisper. But my task is not done. My song has not ceased. And even if I were to be destroyed, I shall not go down without a fight. Fire cannot change the storm. He causes it. I shall be the rider of the wind, and I shall leave behind hurricanes, and my name will roar like thunder. To Shelley. To Shelley. To Shelley. Can this be the same Alex that set out in July 1990? Malnutrition and the road have taken a toll on his body. 25 pounds lost. But his spirit is soaring. He felt like he's gone through a cleansing. <laughs> a damn good one, too. Flushed out the toxins of the society. This society. You're not going anywhere, you hear me? You and I. Look at this. The true harvest of my daily life is somewhat as intangible and indescribable as the tints of morning or evening. It is a bit of stardust caught, a segment of the rainbow which I have clutched. You just get it, don't you? Uh -huh. <laughs> he, uh, he seems different. Your father, I mean, right? He's older. A bit bruised, uh, both physically and ego. You know, I'm beginning to think uh, maybe I was wrong. Maybe there can be a different ending. It could have been that whole charisma thing, but uh, I'm buying. If anyone could change the course of his path, he, he could be the one. Mm, Self-exile, yes, for him, it was an easy way out. And when he said fight, he meant literally fight. Well, I would imagine he would stay in Italy. Fitness, for example, seems like a logical choice. It was the cultural center of his era, right? Venice, absolutely. Every turn you could see the ghost of Shylock and the Moor in the lost songs of Tasso. Casanova's old playground. As much as yours, old friend. You look fatter than I remembered. On the body, especially the face. How's your county's friend? Oh, don't ask, it's the talk of the town. Teresa, isn't it? Do not mock me, Harvey. These young, beautiful creatures pining over you, sooner or later you'd give up and I'd rather just enjoy it while I can. Plus, it's Italia. You get used to it. It's a part of the culture. See, that, that <laughs> is what got you in this carbonari mess in the first place. George, those Italian rebels were bound to fail. You're already in exile, George. How did you get into even more trouble? In exile, yes, but on a mission as well. It's not your bloody mission, George! Not your mission. What's done is done. Italy, just as well. It's good to see you finally settling down for a while. These, I suppose, as good as any. Well, that tone. I can tell. You're getting itchy feet again. What 
are you planning at now? Look, don't. It's not a good time to try anything radical. Uh, the bloody war is still going on, for God's sake. It's going on, and it probably always will. Oh, and it sure, sure is my mission, Hobby. It damn sure is mine. If anything, you should be happy for me. Your friend is going to be a modern-day Greek hero. Just think of that. I was with you when we first walked through those rooms. Deep down, you know it too. Greece is not. You thought of it as your Jerusalem. So many of us did. Too many of us. Don't you see? That it is no more the birthplace of, of muses, the origins of, of art and enlightenment. It's merely a figment of your imagination, an illusion. There's no way back. And, and surely you alone couldn't. The, the, the Greeks are barbaric. They're beyond redemption. They might be barbaric, but those are the sons of Spartans. They've got Hector's blood in their veins. And they deserve to be free, and they will fight for it, and I will lead them to... There's nothing left for me in their hobby. Mary wouldn't even publish my work. Change! Change your words, you stubborn bull! How do you expect people to listen to you if you're only giving them blunt blows? They get offended, wouldn't you? You can still get your voice out there. I mean, you, your works are still popular. Don Juan could be a big success. <laughs> there might even still be a place in, in the parliament after all this. You are needed in your own country. The real fight is never on the battlefield, trust me. You can make a difference, old friend. You just have to listen to not me. Not like that. No, not like that. I'm headed back to Miss Longview, up where the action is. It's my destiny. I belong with my Suli boys' hobby, the bravest, darkest Suli oats. They deserve to win. They deserve to take back their land from the Turks. All they need is leadership and funding, and I can give them both. It's my destiny, hobby. It's my destiny. Suli oats. Suli oats? They're a team of bandits, bloodthirsty and greedy. They only follow you because of your money. Sound familiar? They're like whores. Only with whores, you don't have to throw away your life. You're wrong this time. They are fighting for something dear, something. It's dignity. It's the most beautiful thing, Hobby. And finally, I'm doing something with my life. Why aren't you happy for me? Those bandits, I'll train them and make them an army. And their drums, I can hear it, Hobby. Listen, can't you hear it? Can't you hear their drums? Can't you hear their songs? Tom Boogie, Tom Boogie, it's gonna be my glory too. You're completely mad. Oh, yes, I am! How long have you known me, Hobby? The Isles of Greece, the Isles of Greece, where burning Sappho loved and sung, where grew the arts of war and peace. The heroes hop, the lovers loot, their place alone of birth is mute. I dreamed that Greece might yet be free. Tis something in the dearth of fame to feel at least a patriot's shame. For Greece a blush, for Greeks a tear. Place me on Sunium's marble steep, where nothing save the waves and I can hear our mutual murmurs sweep. There, swan-like, let me sing and die. A land of slaves shall ne'er be mine. Dash down yon cup of Samian wine. He was alone. He was unheeded, happy, and near to the wild heart of life. He was alone and young and willful and wild-hearted. Alone amidst a waste of wild air and brackish waters, and the sea harvest of shells and tangle and wild <coughs> grey sunlight. This is beautiful, John. Did you write this about Alexander Supertramp? No. That was Joyce. <laughs> It does sound like Chris, though, doesn't it? <laughs> or any of these young, barefooted, lovely lunatics. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds uh, about right. Boy's got a lot of problems. I feel like I failed. I thought I could piece together everything and trace back, figure out the roots of his problems, but it's more complicated than that. I thought. I was telling the story of Alex Supertramp objectively. But somewhere along the way, I, the whole plotline got lost. 
I don't know how, or why, or... <laughs> the hows and the whys and the what then? What? We don't have the answers because we don't know what questions to ask. Charge up to battle, there is glory, there is plunder. The sword, the banner, and Hector's helmet. Booah! Booah! It's gonna be my glory too. Awake, my spirit, awake! And if I die, lay me in a soldier's grave. That's Chris. It's just the way he does things. Extreme. Everything is extreme with him. Mom and Dad are hurt. They are angry. But they're mostly hurt. Everything turns into drama with him. Always running away from his problems. What about us then? What about the mess you put me in? Mom said, she kept saying that she heard him. Mom, help me, he said, and that's all I said. But I couldn't help him, she said, because I didn't know where he was, she said. Your father is gone. I don't know where he is. God knows where he is. He's fighting a war, and it's not even our war. It's all that poetry. There's nothing good about it. To devil with it, Creed Byron, poetry. Ada, there is nothing useful or good or even sane about poetry. You can't just drop out on us, Chris. We are the ones who care the most about you. We love you. It's the strangest thing, but I still love him. That club-footed boy who couldn't waltz and bit his nails. I have to get over it and move on with my life. It's hard, but I have to get over it. Imbeciles, morons, slaves to a corrupt society. Who are they to tell me what's right and wrong? Bring me my horse. Rise, sons of Sully, sons of Spartans. Follow my example. Where's Hopeps? Find Hopeps. Tell me. He kissed I... me goodbye and told me things I couldn't repeat. But all my attachments are gone. They're gone. I'll be off now. Don't try to contact me. Won't be able to get letters anyways. Oh, don't tell mom. She'll get worried sick. Try to track me down or something. This will be good for me. I wish I could take you with me, Kareem. Well, I'll miss you, Kareem. I'll be back, though. Maybe uh, write a book about my adventure one day. People will use my proper name. They'll know my story, maybe. One day. What is the end of fame? Tis but to climb a mountain whose summit, like all hills, is lost in vapor. Tis but to fill a certain portion of uncertain paper. For this man writes, speak, preach, and heroes kill, and bards burn what they call their midnight taper. To have, when the original is dust, a name, a wretched picture, and worse, bust. I'm simply just abandoning this monotonous security, conformity, mindlessness. I'm done doing what I'm told, and I'm, I'm going to do what's right for me and for anybody who understands. God has done some great work in the American West, so much to see, much to learn. There is no greater joy than to have an endlessly changing horizon than for each day to have a new and different sun. I have lived and have not lived in vain. My mind may lose its faults, my blood its fire, my frame perish even in conquering pain, but there is that within me which shall tire, torture, and time, and breathe when I expire. I think I'm going to disappear for a while. I want to sleep now. wear that golden helmet in battle. He died of a mosquito bite. <laughs> Sounds silly, I know, but malaria wasn't something that... The doctors had drained 40% of his blood by the time they... And, well. But he did become a war hero. He was mourned 
deeply by the Greeks and the English alike. And well, eventually people would start to get curious about, well, I would start to get curious about how a poet became a warrior. <laughs> Once there was this young man, he was sick of the materialistic society he's brought up in, so he decided to leave everything behind. <laughs> We went on a journey, in pursuit of simple happiness, and um, maybe to find himself. Maybe <laughs> he didn't have a plan. What did he know? 